the month of Rabi'ul Awwal just passed us. And you may have noticed that every khutbah that you attended reminded us of how important it was for us to build a relationship with the Prophet How a life void of mention and love of the Prophet is hollow from within. There's a gap in our life, something missing. And the Khatib must have repeatedly reminded you that if you wish to build this bond with the Prophet the first step you need to take is to learn about the Prophet and study the life of the Prophet And there are those of us who maybe as of recently or for many years have been searching for guidance in the life of the Prophet but one of the things is that when a person studies the life of the Prophet the question you have to ask yourself is what do you want from his life? Because there can be 10 people here and I can give you one book and each of you can learn a different lesson from the very same text. Because what you want from the text, that's what that text will give you. Now in order for you to know what you want, you have to ask yourself what are the problems with me and what do I need? If I know what I need, if I know what the problems are, then I can go and search for answers for those problems. But if I don't know what the problem is in the first place, then what do I do? So you'll find people who will come to, who will come to the Prophet's life thinking that let me study it so that I can gain spiritual benefit. Because without doubt, the Prophet's life offers many spiritual lessons. Then there are those of us who think to ourselves, okay, beyond taqwa and salah and ibadah, Maybe I can find an example of my social issues. I can find a solution to my social issues. But very rarely will you find people who turn to themselves and say, I have an emotional issue. Because in our communities, accepting that something is wrong emotionally is great taboo. You know, I was reading somewhere that if a president of the, a, 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 a person, a president of the United States of America, or any president of the world for that matter, was diagnosed with some sort of physical illness, the population was still tolerated. But if somehow or the other they were diagnosed with some sort of a psychological issue, they would be impeached. They'd be removed. Within time, their ratings would go down and their effectiveness as leaders would be gone. Because we've made taboos out of emotional issues. And because we don't address them and look at them in the eye and say that something's wrong here, or aren't willing to explore the idea, those, those emotions continue to be repressed and they burn within us and they burn within us and we love to ignore them and turn away. But the Prophet ﷺ, we ask ourselves this question, is there something wrong with having emotional uh, conflicts? Is there something wrong for a person to be conflicted emotionally? Is there something wrong with that? The Prophet ﷺ, yes we know, he had physical challenges. Yes we know the Prophet ﷺ, he had his financial challenges and he had his social challenges with his family and so on. He was a human being. But we forget to realize that when the Prophet ﷺ had all sorts of challenges, one of the great challenges he faced was his emotions. And this is the tafsir the scholars give to this ayah. The Prophet ﷺ at times was emotionally conflicted. Fatrat al Wahi is a prime example of this. A period passes by, the Prophet ﷺ doesn't receive revelation, thoughts begin to roam in his mind. You know, all sorts of thoughts. Maybe my Lord is angry at me. Maybe something's wrong. Maybe I made a mistake. And all the maybes start coming in. And you start asking yourself because you have a vision of life. Every one of us sitting here has a conviction, has a vision that this is what I want to accomplish from life. As being an imam in the community. As someone who's a father. As a husband. As a wife. As a business owner. As a citizen. I have a vision of what I want to accomplish. And when we fail in accomplishing with what we want, our emotions begin to stir. And we begin to look for, we begin to look at everything else for answers. We start looking for solutions everywhere, but we're too afraid to look for solutions for the emotional, for the emotions that we have repressed in our hearts. The anger over failure. Every time something goes in a way that we don't want it to go, over the past there is an anger that remains there. That things could have happened in another way. Why did it not happen that way? Anger builds. And then since there's failure and you're experiencing anger, the second emotion which goes hand in hand, in hand with anger is what anxiety. You think of the future, the past, anger, the future, you're anxious. What does tomorrow hold for me? What's going to happen in my life tomorrow? If we fail today, maybe it's possible four years from now we may fail again. If I failed as a parent today, my second and third child, Allah Ma'ala, what's going to happen there? I just had a business that went down, the, went down the drain. What if two years from now it happens again? I just had an issue right now, whatever the case is. If I just fail, there's anxiety that what happens to me tomorrow? How do I deal with tomorrow? That's another issue. 
So when we're looking for real issues that we have, in particular today I want to address emotional issues that we have, where do we search for answers? Why are we afraid to go to the life of the Prophet ﷺ and search for answers there? Where companions come to the Prophet ﷺ and they're emotionally struggling. And the Prophet ﷺ gives them advice. The Prophet ﷺ is walking past this lady and she's sitting on the side of the road and she's crying. And the Prophet ﷺ says to her, Isbiri, be patient. Without turning around, she says, what do you know about patience? You're not feeling my pain. The Prophet ﷺ walks on. Someone comes and tells her, do you know who that man was? That was the Messenger of Allah Wasallam. She had just lost her child. She was sitting at his grave and crying. She comes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I didn't know something happened. I'm sorry. I didn't know it was you. Had I known it was you, I wouldn't have said that. The Prophet ﷺ says to her, As-sabru inda sadmati You want to learn how to deal with your emotions? You recognize when the problem exists. Right there that you have a problem. And that's when you have to address it. You don't talk about patience one year from now. You don't talk about patience two weeks from now. You talk about it now. What can I do? The Prophet ﷺ loses his grandchild. Zainab anha sends a messenger, go and call the messenger of Allah. My son, my child has passed away. The Prophet ﷺ didn't go. He said to the messenger, go and tell her that my du'as are with them. And then she becomes upset. She's a prophet's daughter. She says, go to him again and tell him we request his presence. And the Prophet ﷺ came to the gathering. He had tears flowing down his eyes. And he said, Inna lillahi ma akha wa lillahi ma a'ta. Wa kullu shayin indahu bi ajalin musamma. Fasbir wa tahtasib wa inna lillahi wa inna ilihi rajihun. When you translate these words, you see how the Prophet ﷺ isn't only highlighting his spiritual emotion, his spiritual connection with Allah, but he's talking about real emotions. He's saying, Fasbiri, Fasbir, be patient. Wa tahtasibi, and, and, and have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And know wa inna lillahi wa inna ilihi rajiun that all of our affairs will always were always governed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why are you getting hung up with them? You have your responsibility, but emotionally, the outcome of the issues that you face in your life, you have to submit them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't oversell. Last night when I was coming to yesterday, when I was flying into San Francisco, there was a sister, she sent me a voice note on and she wanted me to respond to her question. And the summary of the seven-minute voice note was. I'm trying to look for happiness, but the more I search for it, the further it goes from me. And I said to the sister, you're missing the point. You're over planning and overthinking the future of your life. You want happiness, focus on today. Tomorrow, plan for it, but don't focus on tomorrow. Don't give all of your effort for tomorrow to a degree where you're losing out today. She's planning, planning, planning for five years from now, how will I be a happy lady? But as a result of her looking there and focusing there only and ignoring today, guess what's happening today? Her possibility of gaining joy and happiness is right out the window. It can't happen because she's too focused on tomorrow. She's too afraid to focus on today. We need to focus on today. What do we do? Now, I want to take you guys to a narration that Imam Abu Dawud brings, Imam Ibn Bajar brings, all sorts of hadithin, they bring this particular narration. And this is, I think this particular narration takes us to a point in the life of the companions where they, express, they must have experienced some really mixed emotions. Mixed emotions to the degree that I don't, I'm not even sure if any human being can share it over a Jum'ah khutbah or try to really go into it because these people were really struggling. <laughs> and when does this narration, when does this narration occur? When did the Prophet ﷺ make a statement? On his deathbed. Try to think of what the Sahaba were going through. You know, for those of you who've ever sat by the side of your parent passing away or were told your mother or father has passed away. It's not easy, it's really hard. And here they're sitting by the side of the Prophet ﷺ, and he's leaving them in just all sorts of mixed emotions. Anger, probably, anxiety, depression, as they had experienced in the Battle of Uhud as well when they thought the Prophet passed away, وسلم, what's going to happen tomorrow? And the Prophet ﷺ sees this. And you know the most beautiful thing about the Prophet ﷺ? Even though he's on his deathbed, he wants to ensure that he has emotionally guided the companions before, they, before he leaves. Because if he can't give them guidance today while he's alive, tomorrow, a few moments from now, when he passes away, there will be no guidance from him. Revelation will end. So, Imam Abu Dawud, he brings this narration, and he actually says, these were the last words of the Prophet ﷺ, from the last words of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ has his companions around him, and they're all just remorsing, and they're crying, and they're hurt internally, that the Prophet ﷺ is leaving them. So what does he do? He says to them, As-salah, as-salah, as-salah. 
or ma ba lantak iman. He's reminding them that when you're emotionally conflicted, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And be just with those who you have authority over. The people who are underneath you, be just with them. The Prophet is channeling energy. Every human being has energy. Now, it's our responsibility to channel that energy. You ever notice this? That our kids at home, when they come back from school, after a long eight-hour school day, when they come back home, they have enough energy to jump on a trampoline, go swimming, and then go play. Go play with their bikes in the front. They come back in, they want to jump around on your sofa. You get tired of telling them, Bache, sofa ba jamma kar. You get tired of telling them, stop jumping on the sofa, but they have enough energy to jump on and off the sofa for the next three, four hours. They have energy. Every human being has energy. But what do you do with that energy? The Prophet ﷺ emotionally gives them a nudge. He pushes them in the right direction. And now how they grieve is in a very positive manner. It brings much change to the world. What does he teach them? He teaches them that if you are down, the only real way for you to get up is through the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only way you can get help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, firstly, is if you have a bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, we always talk about this in particular with the recent political changes. We tell each other, oh, make dua that hopefully things are better. Make dua that for the, against the, uh, you know, for the oppressed. Make dua, make dua. What does that mean, make dua? Let's be real. If I meet you on the way out, or if you meet me, or if we meet each other at a party, or if you meet one of your buddies or friends, <coughs> Other than your own parents, let's put the parents out of the picture because they're just a whole different league. If you go to any other person and you tell them, make dua for me or make dua for the ummah, what does that really mean? You know what that person is going to do? Allah make it easy, I mean, and that's it, done. Our duas have no depth in them. There's no, there's no meaning to them, it's lip service. We've become people, like Hassan al-Basri says, our istighfar has so little value that our istighfar requires another istighfar for the bad etiquette while we made the first istighfar. That's where we are. You know, as salatu wa imamakum. It's as if the Prophet ﷺ is saying, the east and west, north and south will become yours if Allah is yours first. But if Allah isn't yours and you think you can conquer, then nothing is yours in the world. Nothing is yours at all. You want to cry? Every human being wants to cry. I want to cry. You want to cry. Every one of us carries pain in our heart. You know? And some of us think that crying is somehow uh, an expression of weakness. It's not an expression of weakness. The greatest man that came in history that walked on this earth, they cried abundantly. These are people who stood fearfully in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they would rush to making ruku in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are people who spent their nights crying in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They had a bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Umar bin Khattab, as Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi narrates in his muatta, Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anh writes a letter to his governors. Right? He, his, during his khilafah, Islam has now literally spread to the east and the west. Up and down, everywhere, you know, from Yemen all the way up to, you know, um, the borders of Rome and into Persia and into Egypt. And, you know, it's gone east everywhere. And Umar radiallahu anh writes a letter to one of his, not one of them, all of his governors. He writes a letter to all of his governors. He received some complaints. Umar radiallahu anh was very strict on his governors too. So he wrote, a, he wrote a letter to each of his governors. And in that letter, you know what he wrote to them? He said that, إِنَّ مِنْ أَهَمِّ أُمُورِكُمْ الصَّلَةِ the most important thing you can do out of all of your affairs is your salah. That's the most important thing. And then he says, because whoever protects salah, that person has protected their deen. And whoever wastes their salah, whoever wastes their salah, that person will waste everything else. That person won't be a good husband won't be a good father, won't be a good businessman, that person won't be a good citizen, because if in their eyes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no value, what kind of value will they place on another human being? Our first, our greatest responsibility is building a bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The umur of the dunya will come and go. You know, you think about this. You know, men like um, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, rahimahullah ta'ala, many of you may have heard of his name, a great Hanbali scholar, and you know, a giant in his own way, as a, as a scholar and also as a pious person. When we talk about people like him and others from across the globe, I use him as an example for a reason. But otherwise, if you look, for, you look across the globe and you read about great scholars that came or pious people that came in Islamic history, whether it be men like Sheikh uh, Alam ibn Taymiyyah or in Egypt ibn Atallah Skandani or any of them, from whichever, you know, I use these two examples as well as a contrast. Wherever in the world, no matter whichever methodology you have a lenience towards, you will always notice that these people 
did not live in political environments where everything was at peace. <coughs> there was a lot of societies were broken. There were political wars going on. The Mongols are attacking, the Crusaders are ransacking. You know, there's a lot going on. But these people realize that where that was happening, that couldn't stop their life, that couldn't stop their dedication to their deen. Because if everyone hits hold on their deen for political engagement, because we view the two as two separate pathways, then you will be at double loss. But at the end of the day, people, human beings, continue to politically disagree with one another. There's up and down. Not that I'm saying we should be uh, apolitical. I'm not claiming that. But I'm saying that the world just went up and down in its political waves. But we have built a bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've worked with our immediate family. We've worked with our immediate community. And that's what the Prophet is saying. As-salatu wa ma'amalakat imanukum. He's saying to the companions when he's passing away, when I leave, you will continue to gain success in your life if you have Allah with you. First thing. And the second thing, if you are just human beings. Because your acceptance of salah will be seen through your humanity. You guys understand that? The acceptance of your salah will be seen through your humanity. If, for example, you pray salah and it's all, mashallah, your ha and ha is like on point. But at the end of that ha and ha and ayin, when you end your salah, you're doing a good ghayin, you're going all out on ghiba on people. If that's what your salah has taught you, that from spiritually you build yourself, you come out to be uh, a disaster to society, your salah isn't translated. Your spirituality should translate to you being a better human being. That's why we end our salah with what? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's as if we're making a covenant to the people of our right and left that I'm a better human being. My prayer just changed me. It made me into a better human being. It just made me into a better person. So the Prophet is teaching us very powerful, divine words, you know, Jawami al Kalim, concise and precise words. The Prophet saying, be just with those who you have authority over. The reason why I want to highlight the language used here is because he didn't say be just to your children, because that would have restricted the scope of this statement. He says, be just with those who you have possession, who you have authority over. It's as if the Prophet is telling every human being, you have authority to some degree or the other. Every human being has authority here. If you're a wali, you're a khalifa, you have a greater authority. You're a, a person who's just working their day job and coming home in the evening and praying salah in the masjid, you have an authority there. Be just with people. Have good character. Develop yourself. Be good people. You cannot fix the world if you haven't figured out that you need fixing first. If we haven't come to that point, you know, we can't offer things to other people. We can't offer other people. You look at the greatest political activists. The greatest political activists in history, and even in modern times, are those people who are genuine good people. Otherwise, it's sort of crooked people. When you look at them, even though they may have a high position in politics, when you look at a person and you see them being crooked, you're not going to vote for them. You're not going to give them your heart. Even if you do vote for them, you're doing it because the alternative is horrible or was horrible. Okay? Develop yourself first. <coughs> Be good human beings. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu advice as he finishes off his life, as he ends this chapter, and he's guiding the companions forward, is very powerful. And this is the same advice that I want to finish off this khutbah with, the reminder, build a bond with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Make your dua meaningful. Unfortunately, when it comes to our dua, when it comes to us making dua, when I look at my mother, Rahimahullah, and uncles and aunties from my community who are from an older generation, Maybe they weren't as well versed when it came to the difference of opinions amongst the madahib. If you ask my mother, Rahimahullah, what is the Hanafi madhab, she would have no idea what that word even means. You know, there were people from the past, if you told them, Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali, the Mu'attab, Imam Malik, they were like, ah, that's a tongue twister. I don't know what any of that means. But these people, maybe they weren't intellectually sophisticated, but spiritually they were elegant. They knew that whether you tied your hands here, here, or here, that was up for discussion. But what wasn't up for discussion was, once those hands are there, you start crying from here. That was mujma'ari. That was agreed upon. Every person knew that you were supposed to cry in front of Allah. You know, every one of you know that auntie who you were related to, who would wake up every morning and pull up this book that was, you know, really old and dusted and brown pages and the corners were ripping off of each page. And they would sit there and read, not knowing what they were reading, but they were reading it anyway. Because they understood the importance of du'a. That same very old lady who had her little namaz each other prayer, uh, scoff around her head, she'd have her book, she'd have her tasbih, she'd have her musalla and give her zakat every, give her salah every morning, she'd give a, a quarter, a dollar a day. These people may not have been the greatest political activists or activists in general, but these people were spiritually built. And that's how we come. Each generation is indebted to the previous generation. And if you believe other than that, there's a big problem. Allah, you know, anyway, so 
We are indebted to them and their, spiritual, and their spirituality because of what kind of people they were. Where are we today? You know, you ask someone to make dua, or the imam makes dua after salah, and he goes on for another two, three minutes, or four, five minutes. The average, average 30 second dua turns into five minutes, or a khatm al Quran dua, instead of being five minutes, turns into 30 minutes. People start looking at each other. After salah is over, after the dua is over, they come to the imam and say, Chef, the dua was too long. If he made a khat, if he did the khat for 15 minutes, we'd be okay with it. But if it is a dua for 15 minutes, it's awkward for us. We become people. You know, when you travel to another state to visit relatives and they tell you that there's a wedding in the, in the community and they take you along with them, and when you go there, you don't know anyone there, and what's the first thing that, that's what's the only thing that you think in your mind? Let's get out of here. It's really awkward. Come on, I want to go back home. I can't sit here for too long. How, am I, how many times am I going to ask the guy in front of me, how's it going? What do you do? You're going to ask the guy social security too? Like, you know, how much are you going to pry into someone else's life before you look really awkward? And that's our situation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We raise our hands. And we say, Ya Allah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa ala Rasulullah, oh Allah, forgive me. Now what? We've never made God to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no depth there. There's no bond there. My teacher used to say something powerful. He used to say, if you ever want to gauge your level of spirituality, if you ever want to know where you are spiritually, there's a simple measuring stick. Sit down, raise your hand, and see how long you can entertain yourself while talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Simple. And if you get tired five minutes into it, you know what kind of friend you have. And you see how interested you are in your friend. This Ummah right now, we are a people who need to come back to the teachings, the simple, very simple teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala spiritually guide us, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala spiritually charge us so that we can benefit ourselves, benefit our community members, and as always, benefit the entire humanity. <laughs> Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, in Allah wa malaikatahu yusallun ala nabiyya ayyuhu al-lakin amun sallu alayhi wa sallim wa sallim wa sallim Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad kullama dhakara hu dhafilun wa kullama ghafala an dhikri ghafilun Qala nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arhamu ummati bi ummati Abu Bakr Wa ashadduhum fi amrillah wa amar wa asdatuhum hayaan wa uthman wa qadahum ali ridwan Allah ta'ala alayhi wa jma'in Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhira fi hasana wa fi al-akhira fi al-akhira fi al-akhira Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa jurriyatina surrat a'yun وجعلنا للمتقين الإمام لحب العالمين اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا واصرف عنا برحمتك شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي بالحق ولا يقضى عليك إنه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عاديت تبارك ربنا وتعاليت فلك الحمد على ما قضيت ولك الشكر على ما أنعمت به وأوليت نستغفر ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على نبي الأمي سبحان ربك رب العزة وما يصفون وسلام على المسلم الحمد لله